Welcome back to probabilistic machine learning lecture number four. Here is where we are in the course. In the previous three lectures we found in lecture one that probabilities provide a mathematical formalism to reason about quantities that aren't fully identified by data. And that leads to the rules of probabilistic reasoning, some rule, product rule and this theorem. In lecture two we then discovered that one of the pain points of this process is that it can be computationally very hard because we have to track a potentially combinatorially large number of hypotheses. And we discovered the notion of conditional independence as a partial remedy for this problem, which allows us to separate parts of the problem during the reasoning process. Last lecture, three, we then extended the notion of probabilities from discrete spaces to continuous domains and saw that there things are actually almost the same as long as we are able, and this is not always the case, to define an object called the probability density function, which distributes truth over uh, an input domain. PDFs follow essentially the same rules of probability, some rule product rule based theorem. The only thing we have to be careful about is that if we change the definition of the input domain or if we map from uh, one input domain to another, to another random variable, then we have to be careful about the transformation. Today, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about computation. So how do we actually implement probabilistic models on a computer? Of course, this is going to be a topic for the entire term, but it's now time to get a little bit into it. So what are the kind of computations that we have to actually face when we do probabilistic machine learning? So in other interpretations of machine learning, which we will also talk about, of course, over this course, and which you can also follow along in the development of the parallel lecture on statistical machine learning by my colleague Ulrike von Luxburg, you will typically, like as the core computation, encounter optimization problems, finding the best explanation of one part, like the best hypothesis within a space of hypotheses that explains the data best. In probabilistic reasoning, because we have to keep track not just of one hypothesis, but of the entire set of possible explanations, at least in principle, the corresponding computation is not optimization, finding the best explanation, but integration, finding the correct volume of the space we care about and the geometry of the space of hypotheses, or actually the probability distribution over that space. So what are those, those kind of integrals? So we already encountered one last time in lecture number three. Um, just to remind you briefly, this was this example where I tried to infer the proportion of people, the probability for someone to wear glasses in the population. To do that, we introduced a generative model that had uh, this probability pi as the latent variable and we could observe individuals xi and uh, we assumed that each of these were independent, so that's a use of conditional independence, and then assigned actual values to this likelihood. This, this, this is this um, um, uh, Bernoulli probability for each individual to, to wear glasses or not. And we wanted to do Bayesian inference, and Bayesian base inference just uh, uses the theorem of Bayes, so prior, uh, the posterior is equal to the prior times the likelihood divided by the evidence. And the evidence is one of these integrals. It's the integral over all possible values of this latent quantity pi for the data um, given pi. So actually this integral was uh, already came up in uh, Laplace's original argument when he introduced this kind of notion and he didn't really know how to solve it so he used an approximation for it. He already faced this computational issue of having to compute something, the volume of a hypothesis space, that is not easily written down. Now this kind, of, this kind of integration problem will show up all over the place. It's the bane of probabilistic reasoning. And we will have to find lots and lots of tools to deal with these complicated integrals that show up. 
What kind of integrals are these? So um, a very useful notion to just briefly define here is something that you've surely seen before. And if you haven't, then don't worry, we're just gonna do it in three minutes now. And that's the notion of an expectation. So I'm going to use two different kind of notations because I'm sometimes a little bit sloppy and I might uh, swap back and forward between them. I'll either write something like this or something like this to express something that I want to call the expectation of a function f under the probability distribution p to mean this integral. So we will typically assume that p has a density, that's this thing, and um, we now consider some function f and we care about this kind of integral. This is a general form of, um, of which you've certainly seen many examples. So for example, f could be just the linear function, then this is known as the mean of the distribution. And of course, you've seen that before, and if you haven't, then now you've seen it. Another interesting quantity is the variance of a distribution, that's um, the expectation of this function, which is the function x minus the expectation of x. So here I've already, already somewhat sloppy with the notation. Here in x I mean the function, that returns x, so exactly this up here, so the mean, right? And this quantity, let me actually write something on the board, can also be rewritten, and many of you will have seen this before, it's useful to remind you though, that um, the, this quantity, which is called the variance, can also be written as, so we care about the expectation of, under p, of x minus the expectation under p of x squared. This is equal to the integral over x. Now I'll, I'll use the binomial formula to directly expand it. x squared minus x times the expected value under x plus, there's a two missing, the expected value under p of x squared dp of x. Now the kind of argument that we will typically make, and if you're used to integrals, then this is just sort of very straightforward for you. If you have to get used to integrals again, because maybe your, your uh, education is more focused on discrete math, then you will quickly get used to this. Think of an integral essentially as a sum, and then check where the quantity that actually we want to sum out shows up. And you'll notice that, um, so we can now take, like, take apart this integral into three terms. Here is an expectation over x squared d, and I'll also sometimes write something like this, which is given that there is a density the same as p of x times dx, minus two times, and now notice that this is not a function of uh, x, it's just an expectation under x, so it's an integral itself over a different x, so we can take this out, and then what's left is actually another integral over x dpx. Ah, so that's just the square of this because that's exactly the definition of this quantity. And now we have plus the same thing squared again. Uh -huh. Aha, I'll use, yeah, let's put it like this and so not use too many simplifications of notation right away. These two are the same, so one of them cancels and we're left with the expectation of x squared and the p minus the expectation under p of x squared. So this is another definition of the variance. Either it's the expected square distance to the mean, or it's the difference between the expected square and the square mean. We will actually use this in a, comp in a computation in a moment. Mean and variance are the first two, or the first and the second moment of a distribution. So moment is another word for these kind of quantities. Uh, expectations of polynomials. This is called the, the, uh, the non-central moment. This is called a central moment because we are subtracting the previous moments. All of this will just come up sort of along the side, but it's not particularly important. There are other quantities people care about, um, like for example, expected values of the negative logarithm. This is called the entropy. At this moment, we don't have to talk about why and what this is. We will mention it when, when, when it comes up. Um, the reason these quantities are important is that they provide a, um, a, a geometric interpretation or a structural kind of estimate 
of the shape of this probability distribution. And by the way, the evidence up here is itself one of these expectations. It's an expectation under P of the likelihood function. So it's a kind of expected likelihood um, under the probability for pi, which is actually what this is. It's a, it's a, it's a, an, an expectation for how well the model explains the data that we actually got to see. So we will need to use these kind of quantities to do all sorts of interesting things. And that means one of our key challenges on a computer will be to solve these kind of integrals. And of course, you could hope that if you're really careful, then these probability distributions P and these functions F are such that we can always solve these integrals. You know, maybe you have a big book of integrals somewhere lying around on your, in, 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 in your bookshelf, but that's not always going to be the case. And in fact, maybe very early probabilistic reasoning worked under this kind of premise, but even Laplace already struggled, um, you know, over 200 years ago, solving a relatively simple integral like this one. And it took like, really hard work by Leonard Euler to come up with these kind of answers. So, um, to solve this problem, we need general algorithms that do this for us. And um, today we will encounter one of them and I will add it to this kind of slide that I'm going to show you over and over again. This slide will be a feature over the course of the entire course until the very end and I will use it to plug the most important tools that we're going to use um, into one joint picture. I want you to think of this slide as the toolbox of probabilistic machine learning. If you are a master craftsman, you might have one of these wonderful toolboxes that contain everything you need to do your, your job. Right? I mean, you open it up, there are different compartments for different tools you need. Maybe there's like a big hammer on top that you always need to use. And then at the bottom door, there are more complicated, finely precise tools for very specific tasks that really simplify one task and are basically useless for everything else. In this slide, I'm trying to construct something like this because if you want to be a master inference engineer, a master machine learning engineer, then um, you also need this kind of toolbox for your use. And what I will do is this thing has a structure. At the very top, there is the, the hammer that you need for everything. This is the framework under which we will do probabilistic reasoning. And actually, after the first three lectures, this first part of our uh, toolbox is already finished. It just consists of the laws of probability. So to get rid of one variable in your reasoning problem, you integrate it out. To um, uh, reason about one variable given the other, you use the conditional distribution, which directly leads to Bayes' theorem. And with these three, we have everything we need to think about what we actually need to do to solve an, integral pro uh, an uh, inference problem. Now, um, that's just an abstract notion. So when we actually face a concrete problem with data and latent quantities, then we have to do two things. We have to build models, generative models, and then we have to actually solve the computational problem. So on the left-hand side, I will draw up tools that we will come up with to build models. And on the right-hand side, I will collect algorithms that allow us to reason in these models. The separation between these two is not perfect. There will sometimes be some, a, a, a concept coming up that doesn't perfectly fit on one side or the other, but it's reasonably good. And I've already entered one kind of tool that we discovered in lecture two, directed graphical models, which are provide a way to build models and reason about conditional independence in them directly while drawing them. And they are also visually very helpful to think about the structure of your problem. Today, we'll find our first computational tool. And it's going to be called the Monte Carlo method. You've probably heard about it, so let me tell you about this. This goes back to a relative, or this actually is based on a very simple idea, which is that if you want to integrate such a complicated function, or compute this expected value, then you can do so by drawing random numbers that have the distribution 
defined by p of x. And we will talk at the end of this lecture more about what this actually means. But by, at this point, you probably have an intuition for what this means. It's random numbers which show up with a frequency that, um, such that their density approaches over time, as you get more and more of them, exactly this density function. Um, to compute this integral, you can approximate it by drawing such random numbers. And for every individual random number, so we get an individual xi, x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on, we draw them all independently from each other, such that their density is given by p. Then we can approximate this integral by evaluating for every single sample the function we care about, summing up all these values, and dividing by the number of samples. This algorithm, or algorithms of this form, are called Monte Carlo methods. Why? Um, so this is, goes back to this place, which is a famous casino in um, uh, up, up, um, in the uh, French uh, Riviera town of Monaco where the father of one of the inventors of uh, the, Mon the Monte Carlo method apparently used to gamble, a fancy place where you can lose a lot of money. And um, um, why is that? Because these algorithms can be thought of as playing randomized games and observing their, uh, their, their structure or, or frequencies that show up in them. This actually might be motivated by the original way that this apparently was invented. Uh, it was invented, so these, these, the name of the names of these three people is connected to these kind of algorithms. This is um, Stanislaw Ulam, Ulam, I think his name might be pronounced. He's a Polish mathematician who emigrated to uh, the US on the eve of the Second World War. Nicolas Metropolis, a Greek mathematician who also uh, came uh, um, or lived in the States. And of course, the famous John von Neumann, one of the most uh, famous computer scientists of all time, a uh, Hungarian mathematician who also emigrated to the US. So three Europeans holed up in, uh, in, in the US during the Second World War, working on nuclear weapons in the um, uh, Manhattan Project. And apparently the story goes, Ulam was recovering from um, uh, an illness or a sickness in hospital, had, had to spend some time, and he was playing cards with himself, solitaire car, uh, games, and was wondering about how, long it, how, how frequently uh, these solitaire games are actually solvable. What's the probability of one of these solitaires to be solvable? He discovered it was quite hard to do this mathematically because it's an expectation under a probability distribution that is relatively complicated, and then realized that instead of trying to do the computation, he could also just do, let's say, a hundred of these games and the frequency with which he could solve them would already give, them an, give him an, an, uh, an intuition or a first estimate for how frequently the success actually happens. So of course you can do that with any other game of chance as well. And uh, then like, perhaps potentially because of this, Metropolis suggested the name Monte Carlo methods uh, to give it a bit of a grander name of, uh, or sort of notion. One of the first ways these algorithms were actually used concretely in um, a, a real, let's call it a scientific problem, if you like, was apparently to construct densities of neutrons in geometries for nuclear weapons. So one of the, well, maybe the biggest problem in designing a nuclear weapon is that you need to come up with a geometry of how to distribute the reactants inside the chamber of the, of the device, such that when compressed, they are uh, such that when, well, when you build it, the density of neutrons doesn't become too high, so there's no chain reaction, and then when you compress it during an explosion, the density of neutrons arises such that there's a, there's a massive chain reaction and the whole thing blows up. So building these devices in this way was apparently not so straightforward, and especially if you don't have a computer at hand. So what these guys came up with is, so this is a device that was actually built by Enrico Fermi, one of the uh, a later physics Nobel laureate, um, based on like maybe a conversation with Ulam. Here he is again, now without the funny, uh, you know, uh, Second World War attire. Um, 
Uh, this is called the Fermi Yak, the Fermi uh, analog computer. It's a little device that you can drag over a piece of paper to construct paths of neutrons in a nuclear weapon. So what the, the way this actually works, I think it's kind of funny, funny little, little historical uh, side anecdote is you draw random numbers. Oh, how do you draw random numbers? Well, thankfully you're working with John von Neumann and he comes up with a very, very crude but efficient way of constructing random numbers mechanically on a computer. Look up the von Neumann method if you'd like to know how this actually works. And then start at a random place. Imagine you're a neutron and then use random numbers to compute probabilities for how long given a particular material, this neutron is going to travel before it hits another, another particle. These numbers were actually known, they were measured by chemists and physicists. So depending on which material you're in, you're setting one of these wheels to the correct density and then this wheel turns as you're dragging this card along and you measure what the um, effective distance traveled in this material is. It also depends on whether you are a fast or a slow neutron, for that there is a binary switch on this one. And there's a little pen mounted underneath here that um, draws this line while the device um, moves forward until the number you've mentioned, you've, uh, you see up here, reaches the random number you've just drawn. And then um, you redraw another, another number uh, and a new angle, turn the device to the correct angle and do this, uh, like continue drawing. If you keep doing this, then I guess over time you get some kind of density of lines which was the point of this experiment. And then like, you could get a feeling for what the distribution of neutrons is going to be in their geometry. Now you look at that, you get a feeling for what's wrong, you redo the geometry, and then have to do this whole complicated business again. Over time, you get, uh, you, you might then learn, you know, how to build a nuclear weapon. And in fact, that's actually apparently what happened because the, uh, one of the first successful designs for nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons was called the Teller Ulam design. So uh, this guy clearly had an interesting influence on this kind of development. So um, why is this a good idea to use to solve computational problems in exactly this way? Now, of course, well, it might be a good idea because, uh, well, not sure whether it was a good thing that uh, nuclear weapons were, were developed, but clearly it solved a computational issue. But um, maybe we can think about this a little bit more mathematically as well. Ah, before that, I want to give you one more example of how to actually do this. So, so far I've drawn, like, I've waved my hands about a little bit and, uh, uh, you know, said here is how you use random numbers to do some computations and here is like how, what this estimator looks like. Now let's see how you would actually, what I actually mean by this and how I'd actually do this in practice. So let's say, and this is one of the typical teaching examples for using Monte Carlo methods. Let's say we wanted to compute the number pi. Of course we know what pi is, right? It's 3.141 and so on. Some of you will know the first 100 digits of that, of, of that number, but let's say you don't and you want to estimate it because it's a complicated thing, right? It's kind of it's this irrational number. So one way to do so that isn't using an analytic computation is to notice that, so pi is this thing, that number that corresponds to the radius of the unit circle, right? Uh, sorry, it corresponds to the, not the radius, the circumference of the unit circle. So here is a fraction of a unit circle. This is a radius of one. This is one quarter of a circle. So the area under this quarter circle is pi over four. Now one way to compute pi is, let's say if you have access to random numbers that are uniformly distributed over this square. So each dot or circle in this plot is a random number drawn independently of each other. Then the ratio between um, the numbers that are inside of the square and all of the numbers is, well, pi over four, because the area under this quarter circle is pi over four, and the area inside of this unit square is just one. So we could then, that means we can compute this, um, this uh, fraction, or, and therefore this number pi, by drawing such random numbers, just checking which of them lie inside and which one lie out, outside of the, of the circle, computing the ratio between inside and all, multiplying by four, and that's it. 
now we should get pi. So how do we do actually, actually do this in practice? Um, I have actually copied in the code here for you for late, for, to look at later, but let me actually show you the corresponding code. So I've already ran it once. Here is a simple, like maybe this is the simplest piece of code we'll look at all, all summer. Um, it's a very, very, very simple uh, NumPy notebook. So um, I'm introducing a function that produces random numbers. And maybe you notice that that's actually where all the magic happens. So there is this magic thing that produces random numbers. We'll talk about that later in the lecture. But let's say we have this thing that produces uniform random numbers. So this function produces random numbers that lie between 0 and 1. And now we're going to produce a certain number of them. Let's say 100. And um, so here's what I do. I produce actually 200 random numbers. So for 100 experiments, I produce two uniform random numbers. So that gives me an x and a y coordinate in our unit circle, a uh, unit, unit square. Then for each of, each of these, this pair of x and y coordinate, I square them and take their sum. So that means I now have x square plus y square. That's the square radius of um, the corresponding circle on which these points lie. We want, we want to know whether that radius is larger than 1 or less than 1, whether they are inside or outside of the unit circle. So you could take the square root, but it doesn't matter because we just want to check whether it's less than 1. So let's not take the square root um, because the square root of 1 is just 1, right? So having taken their sum of their squares, I check whether they are less than 1. And then take the sum over all of this stuff, right? So that's the average, that's the actual Monte Carlo computation. So this is the point where we compute this quantity. So here f is our function that says are you inside or outside of the, of the circle. Now we sum them all up and normalize. You could think of this as computing what's known as an empirical mean, but um, well, that's just what that is. So we take the sum, divide by the number of samples. And now this actually is an estimate for pi over 4. What we want to know pi because you know what pi is. You don't know what pi over 4 is, right? So I just multiply by 4, so now we get um, something that should look like pi. So if I ran this, this uh, code, let me do this. Then if I run it once, we get 3.12. If I run it again, we get again 3.12. <laughs> 2.96. So why do I sometimes get the same number twice, by the way? Think about it for a second. It's because there's only 100 samples, right? And so it's actually not that unlikely that every now and then we just get the same fraction, okay? So um, if I keep doing this, then you will notice that there's, you know, we get out numbers that are sometimes above, sometimes below pi. And uh, they're actually quite far off from pi, but they're roughly in the right ballpark. So what I can do is I can increase that number. Let's say we don't draw 100 samples, but 1,000. Then the code will still run almost instantly. And the numbers get ever so slightly closer to pi. Now let's increase the order of magnitude of samples once again. Ah, now we get numbers that are not that bad, right? They're at least correct in the first two significant digits, 3.1. This one is even correct in the first three, 3.14. But of course, that's not true for all of them, right? Here is one that's wrong in the third significant digit. And now let's go to a million. This will already take a little bit of time to compute on this, on this uh, um, machine. But this actually looks pretty good. Huh? That's, those are like really good first few digits. Let's try it again. Ooh, OK. At least the first three are now right. And Okay, so the first three digits seem to be roughly right with a million samples. Interesting. So as we increase the number of samples, this computation gets somehow more precise. Let's think about in a moment how much more precise it gets. And um, yeah, I mean, this gives an estimate for the quantity we care about. Now, of course, we know what pi is. This is just a test. But under more complicated distributions, like, for example, the set of all solitaire cards, you, or card decks you might want to try and solve, or the design of a nuclear weapon. It's not so straightforward to know what the right answer is. And this kind of computation allows you 
in a, let's say, sort of a forward way by drawing random numbers, get evaluations of complicated integrals completely without knowing anything about integration. You just replace an integral with a sum. Now, of course, this can be very useful because integration is a hard task. Okay, before we come to our first gray slide, um, let's think about why this is a method that works and why it's actually useful. So, um, here is the basic argument for why Monte Carlo methods are useful tools. It's a very classic old argument and it's pretty straightforward, so we can just do it on one slide, actually on two slides. And it works as follows. Let's say, or, or not, let's not say, here is the thing we want to compute. This is our expected value. This is the quantity we care about. Notice that this is a deterministic quantity. There's no, no randomness here. It's just an expected value of some function under some probability density function or corresponding probability distribution and measure. You might think that that's, that has something to do with randomness, but it doesn't. It's just an integral of one function against a, a measure. What we're going to do instead of this integral, which we don't know how to solve, is to compute this quantity, which is a random number. It's a number that is computed by drawing random numbers from P, independent and identically distributed. By what that means is that we draw a sequence xs for s from 1 to s and um, s to capital S, right? And we all draw them from P. So that means A, they are independent of each other. So for any two S and T, their joint is equal to the product of their individual distributions. And each distribution is given by P. That's what IID means, just to remind you. When we draw these random numbers, for every single random number, we evaluate the function we care about. That function might be f of x is equal to x or f of x is equal to x squared, or x to the p, or log of x, or anything else. Then when we've done so, we sum up all these numbers and we divide by the number of samples. This sum is now a random number because it depends on these random numbers. And every time we run it, just like I just ran our code over and over again, we get out a different random number. Why is this a good random number? Well, one interesting thing we can show about it is that the expectation of this random number itself is actually equal to the number we care about. So here's what I mean by that. Let's think about the expected value of this random number, of this phi hat. By expected value, I mean the expected value under the distribution that is implied by this generative process over the individual samples. What is that? Well, it's an integral, because it's an expected value, over the function we compute, copied in from above, times the entire joint distribution over all of them. But we know that that joint distribution just factorizes in the, into individual terms from S from uh, X1 to X capital S. So we can just write this directly, these individual P terms in the sum already. I've basically already done the first step here for you. Now notice that integrals and sums um, permute, at least in this simple case, because um, of uh, this um, sort of simple regularity structure. And now we see, ah, okay, so what's in here at the end of the sum is actually an expected value. It's an expected value of f under p. And whether we call that xs or x1 or x2 or x3 doesn't matter because they are all distributed in the same way. They all have the same p. So even under our abuse of notation, we are allowed to do that because all of these p's are the same. So this is just phi, right? So what we have here is a sum over s individual equal copies of phi. 
and then divide by s. So that's s copies of phi divided by s. So s times f, uh, s times phi over s, that's just phi. Aha! Uh -huh. So the expected value of phi hat, our random number, is actually the number we want to compute. So this is clearly something you might want, right? It means that this random number will, on average, be actually the number we care about. That's great. And this kind of, quant this kind of property is called unbiasedness. This means that, or this is sort of writing this word, means exactly this. So this means that the expected value of this random number, which is an estimator for the quantity we care about, is equal to the number we care about. Now, we'll have to talk about this word unbiased again because it's unfortunately a very loaded term. So bias is something that's sort of emotional, right? And being unbiased sounds really good, but that's just a mathematical word for it. So try not to be emotionally affected by the use of the word unbiased. It really just means this. It means that the expected value is equal to the correct value. So that's good, right? Um, because it means that this number we are computing might not be all that bad because on average it's actually the right number we are computing. Now of course the, any individual instantiation of our samples of our Monte Carlo estimator are not going to be equal to phi. And you just saw that in the code, right? So let me just run that again so you understand what I mean. So if I keep doing this, right, we will just keep getting more and more numbers and not a single one of them, actually, let me reduce this a little bit again so we can, not a single one of them will produce the correct number pi. But on average, they're gonna be right. So how far away from the truth are they going to be? Well, for that, we need to compute another S expected value and uh, one expected value that might be, might be quite interesting is the variance the expected square distance from this thing we care about so we just saw that the variance and let's compute it is the expected distance of the or square distance of our random number from the value we wanted to have which happens to be the expected value of the random number. So let's compute that. Well, for this, we just plug in what the value of this, uh, uh, of this function actually is. So what, what exa how exactly we are computing it. For um, the expected value of phi hat, I already plug in what we know it to be. It's phi, that was from the previous slide. And then I just plug in the definition of the, um, the uh, estimator. And now you notice that I've already dragged phi inside of the sum. So it was previously outside and I multiplied it with s and divided by s and put it into the sum. So that's easier to do. Now let's take the square of this. That's the square from over here. Um, to do that square, let's be careful. We actually take the product of that term inside of the, the bracket with itself. So that gives an S square and then a product of two sums. And so now to be careful, I have to introduce, uh, give a new name to the summation variable. So one sum we're gonna have to say is over little s, another sum is over little r. And then um, the individual terms in that, in, uh, inside of these sums, I'm directly going to multiply with each other and uh, um, expand, otherwise the slide is too, too small to do all of this. So there will be um, two terms like this, one with s, one with r, multiplied with each other. So in, and in that, there will be two terms with f, one term with f and phi, one term with phi and f, and one term with phi squared. And the minuses are here and the pluses are there. Now I take the expected value, so I can already drag the expectation inside of the sum. And now we just have to be a little bit careful what the expectation is actually over. So here it's easy. These are expectations over um, one individual random variable, f of xs or f of xr. And here it's an expectation over a product of two random variables, xs and xr, and the function taken of them. So what are those? So 
there are several different ways to now proceed. One easy one might be to say, okay, so let's look at these sums. So um, there are two different cases here. Let's, let's, take, let's keep the outer sum unchanged and let's look at the inner sum. So within this sum for r from 1 to s, there are s minus 1 terms where s and r are not the same. They're different from each other. Those are going to be these ones. Now if s and r are not the same, then this here is an expected value over the product of two independent random variables. So their probability, their joint probability factorizes into two terms. Which means we can take the expected values separately and we know what those expected values are. They are just phi, each of them. So that gives us phi square minus phi times an individual expected value, which we know to be phi from the previous slide. So that's phi square here as well. So that's minus two phi square plus phi square from back there. That's, that's not a random number at all. It's just a deterministic quantity. So here we have something minus two times something plus something is just zero. So this entire term just drops out. We don't have to care about this big double sum anymore. So inside of this inner sum, there's only one term that survives, and that's a term where r and s are equal to each other. When that's the case, then here we have an expected value over f of xs squared. So f of xs, and then square the whole thing. And we don't know what that is, so we'll just write down that's what we need, right? So that's a quantity we actually might, might need minus phi square, minus phi square, plus phi square, so that leaves one minus phi square. Okay, so a single minus phi square. Okay, let's plug that in. And now um, notice that there's no s here anymore, so all these individual terms in the outer sum are all the same. So we just get s different copies of this quantity. So now we can get rid of the sum and just might add s times that. We also divide by s square, so 1s survives, and we're left with 1 over s times the expected value of f square minus the expected value of f square. And what that is, is by definition what we call the variance of f under p. Interesting. So the variance of f under p, that's just a number. Hopefully it's a finite number. So that's a number that is given by exactly this, right? which is a deterministic quantity, it's not a random number, it's just a number, a real number. And if we divide it by s, then of course that means as s increases, so as we get more and more and more samples, the, this quantity, which is of course an estimate for the error, right? it's the expected square distance of our estimator from the value it's going to be on average, that square distance drops over time. It drops like, well, the square distance drops like 1 over s. So that means the square root of the square distance, which is like an average absolute distance, drops like 1 over the square root of the number of samples. So is that good or bad? Well, to understand whether it's good or bad, we would need to know a lot more about um, other kind of methods we might want to compare with. And I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm just going to tell you that that's, well, equally bad and good. So there are two different ways of thinking about this. One is that there are actually results in, um, well, stochastics that um, uh, show that there is actually no better rate for such estimators. So random numbers that provide estimates for such a quantity that are unbiased, so that fulfill the, the, the statement or the property we derived on the previous slide, actually have to converge like this rate. That's the so-called min-max optimal rate. On the other hand, there are numerical algorithms for integration, which at least in some settings can converge much, much faster than this algorithm. They're just not random numbers or based on random numbers, and therefore they are not unbiased. There's not even a notion of unbiased there because there's no random numbers involved. But they do converge much faster. And um, so whether this convergence rate is good or not depends on what you're trying to do and what other alternatives you have at your hand. So here's a picture again of what I mean by that. Here is um, 
It's actually based on the exact same experiment I just showed you in code. So this is really this piece of code. Whoops, where's my mouse? Here. Let's just run that over and over and over again and let's compute our estimated values. Basically, this is a quantified way um, to look at the experiment we just, I just showed you a piece of code for. So um, in here you see as the function, as the number of samples increases, so as capital S increases, I have drawn three or four different instantiations. Here's one, there's one, here's a third one, and here's a fourth one of um, such experiments. So imagine that what I just did in, with you on, on, on the screen is we could start with s being equal to zero, uh, uh, sorry, one, 10 to the zero, just a single sample, and then you just get some number. And notice that you always basically have to get either zero or four because you're either going to be inside or outside, right? And then either the ratio is one or zero and you multiply by four, so you get either four or zero. Now, as you get more and more of these samples, you can get lots of different values. And you see that as the number of samples increases, we somehow get closer and closer to the correct value, which is pi, which is obviously here at 3.141 and so on. Um, what I've drawn around this is this uh, sort of uh, funnel of um, the convergence region. So how I got that was that I actually computed the variance of this quantity, which you can of course do on a piece of paper for yourself for this simple experiment, because we know what pi is, right? And um, uh, divided it by uh, S, S and then took the square root of that. And you can see this kind of square root shape converging towards zero. Now notice that not all of the red lines are inside of this domain. That's because it's just an expected square distance. It's still a random number and it might well be outside every now and then, but on average, it's going to be inside. And in fact, on average, this is actually the distance we're expecting to see. And you can see that that's kind of true. Here is the exact same plot again, but now I'm plotting this on a log log scale. Um, and um, of course, to get to make, make that work, I had to take the absolute value of these distances. Otherwise, I would get negative numbers here. So indeed, the red lines are now absolute distances of the random numbers, the estimators, the Monte Carlo estimates from the correct value, pi. And as a um, black line, you now see this square root convergence. Why is that a straight line? You might want to think about that for yourself because it's a log log plot, right? And it, it's converging like, well, think about that for yourself. Okay, so this gives a feeling for whether Monte Carlo methods are good or bad. First of all, in a sense, they are bad because to get high precision from this kind of computation, you need an extremely large computational process. So um, here, this function roughly sort of drops with like this black line roughly has a slope of, uh, of minus one. So to increase the uh, order of magnitude of the um, sorry, minus one half, of course, it has not just roughly, it has a slope of minus one half, of course, because it converges like, um, uh, it, it's a convergence rate of one over S to the one half. And um, so that means to, to double the precision, so to move down by one order of magnitude in here, so to, for example, from minus uh, one to minus two, we have to, um, move two orders of magnitude in the number of samples. So to get this number somewhere down to 10 to the minus seven, which is what uh, you might want on a computer, right? So that single precision, you need to draw something like 10 to the 14 samples, which is an insanely large number. You might want to try that for yourself. Um, think about how many samples your computer can actually draw in a second and think about how many seconds it will take to do that. So this is not the right tool to do high precision arithmetic on your computer. However, on the other end of this, of this domain, there is an interesting behavior here that we are already below um, relative error more or less, um, well, in, in the right ballpark, right? So we're computing a number that is roughly one, like it's three, 
and um, we have an error of less than one after about something like 10 samples. So drawing 10 samples, of course, is a very simple thing to do. So if you are out to compute ballpark estimates for a number that you really don't know, then Monte Carlo methods are a wonderful tool because they're very easily implemented. You just have to draw random numbers and then evaluate the function. So evaluating the function is trivial, right? If you can't evaluate your function, then, well, then you can't do anything, right? So the, hang on. So the use for Monte Carlo methods is as, in a way, the first thing you could try before you spend time trying to implement something complicated. Or maybe also as the last thing you can try if you really don't know what else to do to, to solve your problem. That makes them, in a way, particularly interesting because they will typically be, like, at the top of your toolbox, something you try out first, then you see how, what, what things look like, you put it back, you think about how to actually do your, solve your problem correctly. So a typical setting to do probabilistic inference if you're addressing a new problem is to first try out a sampling algorithm, see if it works, get a rough feeling for what you're trying to do, get a feeling for whether your algorithm works, and then when you actually need to get a really precise estimate, you then typically have to think about your computational step a little bit more. With that, we're finally at um, a great slide. Today, we've been thinking about computational aspects of probabilistic machine learning. We noticed that integrals are a key component of uh, the computational side of this, this uh, framework. To compute almost any interesting quantity about a probability distribution, you have to solve an integral. And one straightforward way, well, maybe somewhat straightforward way, and we'll see in a moment how straightforward it actually is, is to draw random numbers that are distributed like p, and then compute an integral against any kind of function you want, more or less, by taking those samples, evaluating the function, summing up the, the, those values, and dividing by the number of samples. This gives the Monte Carlo estimate this estimate is unbiased and its error, so it's expected, the square root of the expected square distance drops like one over the square root of the number of samples. This means that it's quickly very roughly right, but takes very long to be really right. Now, of course, the one challenge that I've thrown completely under the rug so far is how to actually compute those samples. And after this gray slide, when you've taken a quick break, we have to think about how to really do this. Okay, so um, now that we've realized that we can use random number to compute integrals, the natural next question is how do we actually draw these samples? And so a very first question is just how to draw samples on a uniform um, random interval. We'll get to that in a moment. Let's assume we already have access to uniformly random, uniformly distributed random variables on the unit interval. How do we use those to construct random draws, IID random draws, from other probability distributions? Well, a first thing to do is to use actually the definition of a random variable. Hmm? Hmm. My machine first has to wake up. Here we go. Um, so this is a reminder, lecture three. We can map from one random variable to another by a change of measure, which amounts to, or which can, at least for one dimensional functions, can be uh, sort of done by this transformation rule which is a bit unwieldy to think about, but in practice it actually just means you have to think of the function that maps from the derived variable to the uh, input variable and take its uh, gradient or derivative and the absolute value of that, which is equal to the inverse of the derivative of the map from the original variable to the derived variable. 
we can use this kind of relatively, well, this, this precise process actually to construct precise distributions if we're able to do so. Notice that we can do so if we know what the probability density function is we need to do only, or that we want to get to, only using derivatives rather than integrals, which is convenient. So let's do a simple example of that. Um, one distribution we might care about is um, this one. So this is a probability distribution for which the probability to observe a certain uh, sample is proportional to the negative exponential of the sample value. This is called the exponential distribution. It shows up, for example, as a fundamental process as the waiting time in a Poisson process. So imagine you live in a city with buses that just go around on their routes over and over again, never stopping, but they are in traffic. So they're typically some time lambda apart from each other, but um, the, the actual um, waiting time between them is random. Then a typical, or the, the distribution for your waiting time will be something like this, so distributed like this. How would you get, uh, having access to uniform random variables, how, how would you get to this kind of distribution? Well, um, here the situation is actually quite easy and well, I've given you already the answer already down here. You can, we take our uniform random variable u, let's call, let's call it u, and take its logarithm and multiply by minus the rate lambda, this variable is then distributed like this function. Why is that? Well, let's see. So let's actually do, oh, let me clean up the whiteboard. Let see, let's see if our math works out. So that's the wrong pen. The density for our uniform variable is just one for a unit variable between zero and one. Um, and I've just defined or I've claimed that the interesting variable to look at is this one. We, um, so uh, by the way, here's a bit of a notational issue maybe. I'm calling the random variable u now on the previous slide because I took it from a previous lecture. u was the transformation. So you have to do a variable name replacement in your head. I'm sure you can do that. So um, the inverse of this function is u equal to x to the minus um, x over lambda, of course, and this means uh, that the derivative of, well, okay, let's, maybe, let's say we like, follow the, the derivation from the slide before, that means the, the probability density of x, x of u, is equal to the probability density under u of u of x. That's just one though, because of this, times the absolute derivative of d u of x dx. Just took that from the slide. Well, what is d u dx? It's up here, that's easy, it's minus dx uh, minus 1 over lambda, so that's the inner derivative chain rule times the exponential of minus x over lambda, and then we have to take the absolute value of that, so we might as well just get rid of the minus, right? And that's exactly the kind of uh, uh, PDF that we're looking for. So if you wanted to draw from this exponential distribution, then what you could do is take your source of uniform random variables and take the natural logarithm of each sample, multiply by lambda, take the negative sign, and you get this distribution. What I've done here for this plot is I've essentially shown this process, but I made a minor twist, which is maybe a confusing at first, but actually might be an interesting observation. So what you see in this plot here is I'm, uh, this is u and this is x. Oh, this plot is missing labels. That's stupid, sorry. So here we're drawing u uniformly from zero to one. And then um, actually the black dots are the draws, the red dots are, are regular intervals to think about the density. And then 
each of these points on each of these gray lines is transformed into an X by mapping through this transformation. That's the red line. And then I'm just plotting here what the X values are. And you can see that the, um, um, well, that the corresponding, well, what I'm plotting here in black is the density that we're looking for, that's the PDF. And what I'm doing with these black dots is I'm assigning them their X value and then I'm plotting at a uniform distance um, upwards from zero to the height of the black curve at that point. And you can see that the black dots are somewhat regularly distributed under the black curve, which is exactly what we want. If the black dots are distributed uniformly across this, this uh, space from, uh, that is upper bounded by the black line, then these draws are actually from the distribution that is defined by this PDF. Now, um, if you stare at this slide for a while, you might notice that this red line is not actually minus lambda log of u. Here I've said lambda to one. And um, maybe you'll come to the conclusion that what this red line actually is, is minus lambda log of one minus u. And I'll let you figure out why that works as well. Another example is, let's say we wanted to draw from the beta distribution. Actually drawing from the beta distribution is a little bit hard, but let's first think about a simpler case. So the beta distribution was the prior we used in our uh, experiment trying to infer a probability. So how many, what's the proportion of people wearing glasses um, in, as a prior distribution. And maybe let me write it down. Remember that the beta distribution is beta of x. So in the previous experiment, I called that pi, but let's not use pi too much. Alpha beta is one over the normalization constant that is given by this um, beta function, which is the normalizing constant for this thing times x to the alpha minus one, one minus x to the beta minus one. The minus ones are just part of the definition. And uh, that's it. The normalization constant B of alpha beta is just the integral over this. x to the alpha minus one, one minus x to the beta minus one, dx, x goes from zero to one. Now, this is a bit tricky to work with, but let's say for simplicity, we're only interested in the case where beta is one. One, one, and then this part here is just exponentiated to the zero, so we can get rid of the whole thing. Let's say that's the distribution we care about. Now, what is that distribution for a general alpha like this? Then the normalization constant is easy, right? This is a simple integral over a polynomial, so it's just one over alpha, so alpha minus one plus one, times x to the alpha minus one plus one, so x integrated from zero to one. At zero, this value is zero, and at one, that value is one, so we can get rid of it, and we know that beta of alpha one is just one over alpha. How convenient. So how would we draw from this kind of distribution? So what we actually care about is one over alpha x to the alpha minus one. And just the form of this already suggests what kind of transformation you might want to use. You just have to now think a little bit in your head about which way around all the polynomials work. And we could say, you end up realizing that x will be given by u over one over, uh, to the one over alpha, where u is our uniform random variable. Why? Because that means that u of x is just x to the alpha and um, then well the rest is straightforward we just we need again our p x of x of u is given by p u of u of x that's just one we don't have to worry about that times the absolute derivative of du of x dx. And what is that? Well, it's um, 
1 over alpha times x to the alpha minus 1 chain rule. And that's what we want, right? So we're done. Okay, so that's relatively easy for the beta distribution, but you can already see if you wanted to do this now for a general beta distribution where there's not a one here but something more complicated, things will quickly get much, much more complicated. Now, as a homework for next week, one of your, your math questions this week actually is to do this derivation. I'll tell you how it works and you just have to show that it's actually true. So the way we, could, we draw from a whole beta distribution is, so with two parameters, is to consider true uniform random variables. Let's uh, call them, sorry, let's two different random variables, let's call them x and y as our inputs, and they actually have to be gamma distributed rather than uniform distributed. How to draw from a gamma distribution is another little trick that is actually feasible from a uniform distribution with a little bit of trickery. With this, We've now realized that we can use random samples from a probability distribution to compute integrals against this distribution, if you want to put it this way, using the Monte Carlo method. <clears throat> Once you have these random numbers, the remaining integral is actually easy. Well, it's easy in the sense that computing the Monte Carlo estimate is straightforward, that estimate is quickly, so as a function of the number of samples, quickly a decent estimate, but it takes a long time to become a very good estimate. Then we wondered, well, um, okay, so that's fine, but maybe the tricky part here isn't actually summing up those samples. The really tricky part is how to produce those random numbers. We've now seen that for basic cases, there is at least a principal way to do that using the concept of a random variable. So taking a base distribution and transforming into the space in which we would, or onto the measure on which we would like to, to sample from. However, we've now realized that this is quite hard to do uh, for anything other than uh, very basic distributions. So the question we now have to pose to ourselves is what kind of algorithms can we construct to do this more efficiently and generally and um, end up with algorithms that we can apply to more or less arbitrary distributions. Now, I'll talk about these now for a moment. We'll get, we'll today spend the rest of this lecture to introduce a few basic algorithms of this, of this form. Before I get to that, I want to mention on the side that one question I've totally like, brushed aside so far is what actually a random number is to begin with. Normally, I would like to have this discussion at this point in the, in the, on the, of the lecture. However, it's really the kind of conversation that is extremely difficult over a recorded uh, session. So I'm going to keep this for the flipped classroom. We will talk about what a random number is and sneak preview, I'm going to argue that random numbers don't exist. So if you want to hear more about that, you have to tune into the flipped classroom and we will talk about what exactly is the kind of randomness we need here for these algorithms and why it's very difficult to precisely formulate philosophically what a random number actually is. For today though, or for at least for this lecture, let's continue with something that's a bit easier for me to present to you in this kind of frontal way and think about what we need to do to more generally produce samples from more general distributions. And um, for that, maybe we first think about why this is actually hard to do. So, in, um, uh, as I already said, in other, in other formulations of machine learning, statistical formulations in particular, where you only care about the minimum or the maximum of a function, you can do some kind of local computations. You just have to, you know, run down the hill until you reach a point where uh, the sort of the, 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 the function, well, reaches its minimum, right, where the gradient is zero. Sampling is harder because we want to produce numbers whose density is given by the probability density function and the density is really a global object. The density could for example have an additional kind of, so it could have like a point where it's maximized but that point can be very far away from the mass of the distribution. Most of the distribution can be really flat out. It can also have little isolated islands that are far away. So to have an algorithm that produces samples from a distribution, 
we really need a form of a global description of the entire probability density function. And that's really what makes sampling hard. Another challenge is that the function we're interested in actually isn't generally fully accessible. So um, you notice that one of the first, well, the, the motivating example I gave for why we need to do, why we need to solve these integrals in the first place is the computation of posterior distributions. So in posterior distributions, the object we can evaluate easily is the product of prior and likelihood. And by easily, I mean that these are functions that are available once you've defined the generative process. But the uh, hard part is this normalization constant. And it's often confusing to people why this is even hard because uh, this is just one number, right? And it's really just scaling the entire distribution. This seems to be the complicated bit up here that gives all the structure. Why is it so important to get this right? Well, because it's part of the computation, right? And otherwise it's not a probability distribution. But you, of course you're totally right. It would be nice if we had algorithms that just um, that just um, get rid of this problem of having to use this, this constant. So what we would like to have are algorithms which are able to sample and they are even able to sample from a distribution if we don't know its normalization constant. So in particular, if we don't know this number. So what we would like to have is an algorithm that can draw from the distribution P, assuming it's a probability distribution, even if the only thing we can actually evaluate is a function called p tilde, which is proportional to p up to some number z, and z is supposed to be arbitrary and unknown in some sense. There are algorithms out there that do that, and we will deal with them primarily in the next lecture, number five. But today, at the end of this lecture, I'd like to introduce to you two basic algorithms which used to be used in practice. Actually, they're still used in very special corner cases, but which have more didactic value today to understand why it's hard to build computational algorithms that draw from a general probability distribution. And the first one is actually an ancient algorithm that goes back to, um, well, ancient, you know, <laughs> to the 18th century to a French, French mathematician called uh, Georges-Louis Leclerc, who then became uh, the, the um, Count of Buffon, the Comte de Buffon, uh, later on in his life. And it's called rejection sampling. Many of you will have heard about rejection sampling before. If you haven't, it doesn't matter. Here is how it works. And if you've heard about it before, we'll know, you will have maybe something interesting to talk about anyway. So it's exactly an algorithm for the situation in which we're trying to sample from a distribution p tilde, that's this black line in this picture, which is um, only given up to a normalizer. And the one thing that is required is that there is another distribution q, that's this red curve in this picture. We call this distribution a proposal distribution. And we assume that we know for a fact that there is a number c, in fact we know the value of that number c, so it's a constant, such that if we scale this red probability distribution or the actual probability distribution that gives this red line by this constant c, then it is an, an upper bound to the distribution or the function we would like to draw from. So that such that c times q is larger than p tilde. Here, the black line is the distribution we want to sample from is p and the red line, the proposal distribution, I've chosen to be a Gaussian distribution. Now I haven't told you yet what Gaussian distributions are, but let's be honest, if you're taking a probabilistic machine learning class and you've never heard about a Gaussian distribution, then um, it's gonna be tough for you anyway. But just to remind you, let me, let, uh, just, let me just write down the, the form of the basic Gaussian distribution. We will get to the Gaussian distribution in one week. So like, if you find this confusing, just wait for a week and you'll hear more about it. Um, the Gaussian distribution um, with a mean and a variance is given by a normalization constant times the exponential of a quadratic form 
And in 1D, as in this picture, that's just 1 over the square root of 2 pi times a scalar times exponential of minus x minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared, where sigma is actually defines the variance of this distribution. It gives a standard deviation, sorry. It gives the width of this bell, this bell curve, and mu is the center of this bell curve. Here mu is 2, and uh, sigma in this case is actually also 2. And um, yeah, that's it, right? So this is, a fun this is a distribution from which we can draw very efficiently. There are algorithms for it. I'll talk about those in a week or so. And um, so now here's how the algorithm works. We're going to draw from this distribution. We know how to draw from this red distribution, this proposal distribution. And then for each such draw, so let's say we've drawn this number here, uh, I don't know, three, right? Something like three. And then what we do is we draw a uniform random number from zero to one, scale it by the height of the red curve here times the upper bound. So we do this. This gives us a dot. We draw, we put that dot, I mean, we don't actually make a graph, right? But you can men mentally think of putting the dot somewhere um, at, at, this uni at this uniformly random location between zero and the, the upper bound. And then check whether that number, let's say we put it here, whether that number is above or below the black curve. For that, we have to evaluate the black curve once, right? So, and we have assumed that we can do that. So if that dot is above the, the black line, so if it's larger than P tilde, then we reject it, we throw it away, we never talk about it again. And if, we, if, if it's below the black line, then we accept it, we add it to our stash of samples. So by that I mean we add the value x of this input domain, not the height of the bar. As we do so, we collect a number of samples, and those samples are actually IID draws from the black curve. Why is this the case? Well, I'm going to give you a visual proof of this rather than a formal one, which is just look at this graph. What you can see here is these dots below the red curve. I've produced those by drawing from the red proposal distribution, and for each individual sample, drawing this uniform number between zero and the height of the curve, and then um, putting the dot there. So this is a process of producing points that are um, uniformly distributed on the area that is outlined by the height of the probability density function. So these are clearly IID draws from the red curve. And such, um, yeah, such, such points then are just uniformly distributed on this uh, nonlinearly delineated region. So using this rejection sampling method, what we're doing is we're just cutting out a, a set of samples that are uniformly distributed under the area outlined by the black curve, right? And therefore, they are IID draws from the black curve. Fine. Great. So this is a method that works. And in fact, this is actually a method that is still used in practice in very low-level libraries to produce samples from basic, simple distributions for which it's possible to write down very efficient such proposal distributions. For example, the low-level library algorithms that draw from gamma distributions are typically produced in this way, and actually even the internal algorithms that draw from normal distributions typically have an internal step that is essentially a rejection sampling method. So um, this algorithm is around, it's not wrong, it's also very old, but it has a flaw which gives us a feeling for why it's hard to draw from probability distributions. And that flaw becomes apparent. I mean, it's already somewhat apparent in this picture, which is that if there is like a spike, essentially, somewhere in your distribution, and that spike is hard to capture with your upper bound distribution, then um, you will be forced to create a situation like in this picture, where there's a lot of space here and there and over there, um, where, where we have to throw away samples. So in this picture, roughly half of all the samples visually will have to be wasted, right? We have to produce them just to find out that we can't use them. Now that's already a problem in one dimension. In two dimensions, the situation gets even more complicated. So uh, actually not in two, but in multi-dimensional settings. And it can be so that intuitively you can uh, imagine that 
if this, is, if this were a higher dimensional space, then the volume that we have to throw away due to rejection gets ever larger and it quickly becomes dominant. To get a feeling for this, here is a great intuitive uh, example that stems from the book by David Mackay that I've mentioned before um, from chapter 29, section 3 in that book actually. It's, uh, that gives an intuition for why, this, why, why this, this rejection rate can rise very quickly as the dimensionality of the problem increases. And it's a thought experiment. It's obviously not meant to be a practical setting. But imagine you wanted to draw from a Gaussian distribution like the one I just wrote down here using rejection sampling. That's of course a stupid idea, right? But let's imagine you wanted to do it. So we have one Gaussian distribution that is centered at zero and it's this black line here. That's our P. And we would like to use another Gaussian distribution with another variance um, as our proposal distribution Q. So that's the red dashed line here. It's also centered at zero. And of course we have to give it a wider variance, otherwise it's gonna be very difficult to do this. Um, so let's say sigma Q, that's the variance of this multivariate, uh, sorry, of this uh, red dashed distribution is larger than the one of the distribution we want to sample from. Now we need um, the, this red curve to be above the black curve, right? So we need this upper bound. What's the optimal value for that to, uh, um, sort of upper bound C to get this to just about make this red curve as high as the black curve? You can think about this for yourself for a moment, but you'll realize that just visually that this red curve will be above the black curve if we make it match it up here at zero. So if you look at this expression here on the board and set mu to zero and then set x to zero because that's where the center of this distribution is, then this entire term is just one. And we can easily find what we, set Q, what we have to set q to to make this larger than the other thing. This, by the way, is a determinant of the covariance matrix. In this case, I've assumed that this matrix sigma is given by a diagonal matrix of elements all the same sigma squared. So it's essentially just sigma squared times the unit matrix. And um, then what we have here, this determinant is just, is just sigma squared to the n, right? And the square root of that, which we have to take here, is just sigma to the n, or I have decided to call this d, I'm sorry, d, um, which you can see here. And now clearly, just to make the normalization constant of this, of this dash distribution larger than that of the black distribution, we just have to take sigma equal to uh, sigma q over sigma p to the d. And you can already see where the problem comes from. So this number, of course, increases with exponentially with d. So as the dimensionality increases, we have to make um, sigma q exponential, uh, sorry, we have to make c exponentially larger to keep this upper bound on uh, the distribution we want to draw from. Now, the ratio of acceptance is proportional to the volumes of these two distributions. So to remind you of this picture, right, the acceptance probability is proportional to the volume under the red curve versus that on, under the black curve. Now those volumes are actually given by these normalization constants. So this normalization constant is for this uh, diagonal uh, um, case is exactly this, right? So the, 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 the term here below, or actually just one over C, right? For the relative volumes. And that means that the rejection rate will rise exponentially in D. And this happens very quickly. Even if the um, sigma Q is only 10% wider than sigma p, as in this picture, then in a hundred dimensional space, hundred dimensions is not a lot, in a week or two from now, we will talk about thousands and million dimensional spaces, then um, the acceptance rate is already one in 10,000, which is an extremely wasteful process, especially if you keep in mind that we are only using this to produce samples and the sampling estimator itself already drops in error or like, like, like improves in, in performance with the square root of the number of actual samples. So the number of actual samples of effective samples is the number of samples we draw from the proposal distribution 
times this or divided by this acceptance ratio. So that means that they, to get to an even, even reasonably correct estimate, we have to drastically increase our computational resources. So really, rejection sampling only works in extremely low dimensional settings. So we need to have a better algorithm to fix this kind of issue. So normally at this point in the lecture, I ask whether people can think of a better algorithm. And then if I'm lucky, what usually comes up is the notion of importance sampling. Importance sampling is a variant of rejection sampling, or maybe it's a minor improvement of rejection sampling, which ensures that samples aren't actually thrown away, they are kept around and are just weighted by how likely they would have been to be accepted. In many ways, important sampling is essentially a continuous version or a smooth version, if you like, of rejection sampling. So instead of throwing away in, uh, individual samples, we instead compute, um, we use the following idea. Okay, let's maybe, maybe go a bit slower to this. So here's the quantity we would like to compute. That's our estimate again, that we've now seen several times on the slides. Now, assuming that we have a Q of X, our proposal distribution, and we don't need it to be larger than P anymore, an upper bound, we just need to make sure that it's larger than zero wherever P is larger than zero, so that it has support wherever P has support. Then we are allowed to extend this expression by just essentially multiplying with one and drawing the Q, Q over Q, into um, the expression P over Q. So now we can think of phi as an integral against q of a different function. It's not f of x anymore, but it's f of x times p of x divided by q of x. And we can do Monte Carlo estimation on this problem by drawing from q, from our proposal distribution, and for each sample evaluating not f of xs, but f times p over q. And this term p over q is then often called a weight, an importance weight. Why? Because if Q has a very small value at this point, then that means X of S is drawn rarely it is, um, because Q has a low value. So when it's drawn, it should be given a high weight because it actually represents a larger um, uh, region of mass sort of uh, in, in P or a larger density in P than um, it does under Q. Interestingly, notice that this is just Monte Carlo estimation. So there is uh, no approximation here anymore. So, uh, or not at all actually. So this means this estimator is unbiased and its error drops like one over the square root of the number of, uh, of samples. So that's great. It's, um, it's really an uh, like an estimator we might want to use purely on this, these theoretical grounds. But, um, oh, okay, actually before I, I, I give you the big but, uh, there is um, also, um, a variant of this, so what I've written here, uh, obviously only works if you actually have access to the true P after normalization. Now let's say we don't know this normalization and there's actually a trick that um, allows you to uh, fix this by, you know, you just introduce this unknown Z and then estimate Z as you go along. So you can stare at this for a while to convince yourself that that's possible. So basically you just compute an estimator for the normalization constant alongside the estimator for the true integral. Doing so is not unbiased anymore because you are estimating two variables at the same time and you can show that if you're trying to do this proof that we did on previous slides that um, for unbiasedness then this proof is not going to work in this case because you can just not separate the integrals anymore, right? You can imagine that that's the case because there's one big integral over here which you cannot drag into the sum anymore. However, um, well, yeah, so fine, then it's biased, but it's still Monte Carlo estimate, right? So the estimate of the, of the normalization constant will eventually become right, and over time this will become kind of a good estimate again. <clears throat> so that actually is not the big problem. The big problem is that what I've left out here is when, when saying that the error of this estimator drops like one over the uh, square root of the number of samples, I've I've basically used a big O notation, like it drops like, and I've left out the normalization, uh, sorry, the, the, the constant in front of that rate. And what is that constant? Well, that constant is now given by, let me just actually go back in the slides to show you this again. So 
the, we found before that the variance of the Monte Carlo estimator is given by the variance of the function it's trying to estimate, which is a constant, divided by s. Now that variance is now not of f anymore, but it's of f times w of this other function. And this, quanti this function can have a much higher variance than the original f under p. In fact, it can even have unbounded variance. And of course, if a constant is unbounded, then this convergence rate doesn't help us anymore at all. So to give you a feeling for this, and that's the final thing we're going to do today before I stop, let me um, show you an another picture, which is a bit of a confusing picture. So you might have to stop the video at some point and stare at it for a while. So what I'm trying to show you here is, this is a bit of a constructed situation, is let's say we, we do um, important sampling from this, we want to draw from this black distribution using this red distribution as a proposal distribution. So notice the strength of, of important sampling. The wonderful thing is that we don't have to have our proposal distribution be an upper bound to the, the, the true distribution anymore. We don't care. Um, it, it can be in principle anything, at least on paper, as long as it has support wherever the black line has support. So here I'm using a Gaussian distribution as a proposal distribution. Gaussians have full support everywhere, so it, uh, this is always true. And now what I do is I draw these red dots from the um, uh, proposal distribution. The black dots, are, by the way, are actual draws from the correct black distribution, which in this case I can do because it's an experiment for, um, uh, for uh, comparison. And the golden line is the importance weights. So what that is, is it's the ratio between the red and the black curve, right? And um, actually it's the ratio between the red and the black curve multiplied by f. So that's, the, uh, that's actually the function which we're trying to integrate, if you like. So this is f times p over q. And f here is, let's say we want to estimate the mean of this black curve. So f is here this uh, uh, linear function, this gray, gray bar here. Now, um, you can see, you can guess kind of that this golden function has a much more complicated distribution under, uh, when, when we sample from the, from the red distribution, then the black curve would have times this linear function. And that's of course actually what we see as well. So here in this bar plot in black, you see uh, the empirical distribution. So just a histogram of samples drawn from the black curve and multiplied by X. So, an, so an, uh, samples of, of whose mean is going to be our estimator for the mean of this black distribution. And in red, you see the corresponding important sampling uh, the numbers. So that's f times p over q. And you can see that this red distribution is much, much broader than the black distribution. It has a much higher variance. And in fact, this, there are even settings where, and you can actually find them in, um, uh, there's a nice exercise in David Mackay's book that shows this. It's a different setting than the one I have on this picture here. But there's even situations where the variance of these, of, of these functions is just unbounded. So you could even get infinite variance for these kind of um, uh, estimators. And it's in practice very hard to detect when that happens because these, these very large values that actually make the variance unbounded, it, of course, happen extremely rarely. So we don't really get rid of this problem of um, massive reduction of convergence rate when we move from, pro from rejection sampling to importance sampling. We just get, it's just easier to design an importance sampling method than it is to design a, re a rejection sampling method. But the problem of slow down convergence rate remains. And in fact, the sort of this exponential slowdown in higher dimensionality is still there. It's just a little bit more hidden away because the, um, we actually get samples without rejection. It's just that these samples have much, much higher variance potentially. So with that, I'm actually at the end of today's lecture. It's a bit of a stop because I'm leaving you a bit of a, a, bit of a cliffhanger, right? Before we move into actual methods that help us address this computational issue of sampling. I told you today that Integration is extremely important in probabilistic machine learning. It's the fundamental, it's sort of the, the defining operation of probabilistic machine learning. 
we can one way to address this integration problem is to use random numbers sampled from the probability distribution against which we want to integrate to compute such integrals using the Monte Carlo method. This is a, a, a framework that very quickly produces rough estimate of estimates and only very slowly produces precise estimates. It's maybe a tool that you want to try first because it's usually easy to implement, but it's not the most efficient way in general to solve integration problems. We found that in any but the simplest possible base cases, there is no analytic way to draw these samples. So that's actually the challenge in designing Monte Carlo methods, not the integral itself, but producing the samples. Um, there are, I, at the end of this lecture, we saw some basic methods for producing samples from non-trivial probability distributions. These work in low dimensional, simple settings, but they typically do not scale to challenging, in particular to high dimensional problems. So in the next lecture, we will have to deal with algorithms that have been developed over the past century actually to that um, scale much better to higher dimensional settings. These will also not be perfect. Actually, no algorithm is ever perfect, but they get us way closer to very interesting performance um, and can be used for real problems. Thank you for your time.